Good morning, everyone. It's great to have you in church this morning. Why don't you stand to your feet as we worship together this morning? Can I just remind you we're here to worship God? We're here to come into His presence. He is here. His word tells us that we're two or more are gathered, that He is right there with us. So this morning, how have we arrived? Have we come with praise and thanksgiving, like we're told in Psalm 100, to give to God because He's worthy this morning? So come on, let's take these moments and, and give Him praise, give Him honor for who He is, what He has done in our lives, what He continues to do in our lives and in our town. Amen. Come on, let's worship together this morning.
You are faith in every season. You are faith. You never change and you never fail. Oh, yes. Sing there won't be a day. There won't be a day. Come on. That you're not by my side. That you let me fall, singing all and all of my life. Oh, sing it over tomorrow.
perfect love casts out all fear that's the God we come to worship this morning the God that casts out our fear the God that banishes our sin buries our shame and tells us that we're welcome in his family and that he loves us God we love you this morning we give you all the praise all the honor God all the worship this morning thank you for the cross thank you for your sacrifice God saved me, saved us. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus.
comes in glory. Come on. To reveal the fullness of His reign. our attention, we focus our eyes on you today, God. I just feel like this morning maybe there's people in the room that <clears throat> things haven't gone according to plan for. But God would say, hold fast. God would say, stand still. God would say, stand in the face of adversity because he's the same God on the mountaintop as he is in the valleys. So we thank you this morning that that's who you are, God. God, we think of those here in a valley this week in our church, God. We think of those who are bereaved, Father. We think of those who are, are in a desperate place today, God, but we know you're there. It says in 1 Peter 1, 6 to 7, in all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer in grief or all kinds of trials. These have come that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which even perishes when refined in fire, may result in praise glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Count it all joy in the trial this morning. Count it all joy when you feel like you're perishing. Count it all joy when you feel like you're in that ref refining season. Father, we thank you that you're there in that. Oh, we worship you this morning, Father. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. You may take your seats. You're very welcome to Life Sunday. And I was speaking about things not going to plan. I'm going to tell you a quick story, just which may get me in trouble with my wife. So our baby came 11 weeks ago, maybe not just according to plan, a little bit early. And um, Jade had in her mind envisioned this beautiful going home outfit. Pinterest it a lot, you know, um, had this all planned for the gram. You know, the, the Instagram photo would be so special. Um, and then all of the things not going to plan and everything being an upheaval. This is actually how Finn went home from hospital. Is there a picture? Which we'll hopefully get. Yeah. So, like a little ball of wool. <laughs> because it was the only thing that fitted him. But it didn't change how proud I was, did it? It didn't change the, the joy that was in me. It didn't change any of that stuff. And that's, that's a picture of God, isn't it? Things might not go the way we think they're going to go, but he turns it around for good, doesn't he? So I'm going to invite the men to come forward um, to receive the offering this morning. If you're new this morning, we'd love you to fill out one of these little connection cards. That's to help us get to know you better, um, get connected with you. I want you to think about where your offering's going this morning. You know, what you put in there could represent a life transformed this morning. What, what you put in there could represent somebody being fed, could represent... A kid being reached and kids reached could represent someone finding that wee bit of hope that they've been searching for this whole time. It says it's better to give than to receive, but sure, we're only giving back what we've initially received, aren't we? Um, so I'm just going to pray for the offering. Father, we just ask that you would, you would bless every, every 
every sacrificial gift this morning, Father. God, we ask that you would use it for your glory, God. We ask that you would use it to reach the lost, Father. Use it to, to speak hope into the lives that, that need you, God, that are desperate for you, Father. So we ask you to supercharge it now in Jesus' name. Amen. So, last night we launched something kind of cool. Um, we've been working, my team's been working on for a while. Um, the new GP app, Can I Get a Woo? Okay, so if you have the old app, we'd like you to scroll over on your phone now, just delete that bad boy, because this is the new app in town, okay? This app has got everything you could possibly want to know about church in it. This is a better way for us to communicate with you. It's church in your pocket, okay? I'm going to just go through a list of some of the features. This is very expensive. Okay, so you can read the Bible in this app. You can get all of the Facebook and Twitter and Instagram accounts. You can see the, the latest news from church in a news feed. There is a section on it where you can, it's, it's built into our given so that it seamlessly does all of your online giving. You set it up once and then it's good to go. Um, I now don't have the list in front of me. The weekly leaflet that the, has been hailed as the bulletin. We're going to kill that word. The weekly leaflet is on your app. It'll be there every week. We can communicate with you. You can watch live stream on the app via YouTube. You can watch all of the past sermons. You can listen to all of the past sermons. There's a very snazzy section on there called Next Steps, where you can sign up for baptism, you can sign up for a life group, you can sign up for Planted, and this is a cool part, right? So today, Pastor Jason will be speaking, and if you hit more on your app and go to notes, you will have follow-along notes for Pastor Jason's message, okay? So you can fill in the blanks. If you get it wrong, no one will ever know, but that's already there. Um, this is church in your pocket, all right? This is a better way for us to communicate with you. We can actually, if you have this in your pocket, we can send you a message via this. So if we need something out there, we need you to know something, we can do that within seconds. So we'd love you to go to gpastures.co.uk forward slash app on your phone, and this will automatically download the app. Scroll over, delete the old one, the new app is in town. Okay, so I'll just um, I'll just pray before we go back um, into, into one more worship song. Um, Father, God, just at the start of this day, Father, we're careful to put you at the center, God. We're careful to put you first, Father. We're careful to fix our eyes and our attention on you, God, because we know that when you walk into the room, anything could happen, God. We know that when you walk into the room, Anyone could see change. Anything could change, God. So we put you at the forefront, Father. We ask you to come and move in a new way today, God. Come and do something we didn't even expect, God. Yeah. In Jesus' name. Let's stand as we just go into worship for one more. Jesus 
Say hello to somebody on your way down. I said, said hello, not have a. No, I'm only joking. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Welcome. I'm Pastor Bill Wilson, Metro World Child. Yes. <laughs> um, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Life Sunday here in Green Pastures Church. First Sunday of the month, um, of, of which on Life Sunday we, we talk through our vision. Make sure we're all still on board with that. Everybody remember what it is, L-I-F-E. L is for? No, 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 no. Hold on. <laughs> Let's try that again. L is for? Let's th one more time, right? We're going to get this. L is for? Love I is for? F is for? It's tailing off. E is? Yes, L-I-F-E. Okay, and each, each month of 2019, what we've been doing is we've been teaching through our cultural values, okay? Everywhere where you have people, you will have culture, okay? Is that a family? Is it a school? Offices, factory floors, and even in churches, there is a culture. Um, if someone says to you, that's not the way we do things around here, what they mean is, that's not our culture. That's what it is. Um, but heaven has a culture. The kingdom of God has a culture. 
And the problem is often it's very different than the one that we kind of propagate and live in. But what we have done as a church, we have set aside these 12 things, these 12 cultural values, and we're not saying, look, we're doing all this, we're amazing at this. No, no, no. What we're saying is we're aspiring to these things to bring the culture of the kingdom of heaven here in Ballymena, County Antrim. These is how we're trying to be a reflection of God's heart here. Very quickly, here's what we've covered so far in 2019. If you've missed any of these, or maybe you just need to go and listen to them again, they are core and foundational to the church that we're trying to build here. First one, Jesus is our example. Then we looked at his presence is our desire. Vibrancy is our atmosphere. Heaven is not a quiet place. Multiplication is our mission. We're here to make disciples. Servanthood is our posture. We're here to be servants, just as Jesus was a servant. Honor is our attitude. Acceptance is our disposition. Family is our model. If you're not a life group, get in a life group. Family is our model. Encouragement is our language. Last month we looked at excellence is our spirit. It's time for us to arise and shine, to stand up and stand out. And this month, we're going to look at this one. Grace with truth is our position. Grace with truth is our position. And the little tagline for it is this. We live forgiven, we will forgive, and we will believe the best of one another. We live forgiven, we will forgive, and we will believe the best of one another. What, what does believing the best of one another mean? It means when you hear that juicy bit of gossip, you don't listen to it, and you definitely don't repeat it. It means believing that the intention of your brother and sister in Christ was good, even if they made a mess of something and hurt you or offended you. We believe that, you know, they were, their intention was good. It means not automatically believing a rumor that's kicking around about somebody. Let me ask you this. Hands up, who in the room this morning would like people to believe the best about them? Yeah, all of us. <laughs> Let's do that for each other. Let's believe the best of one another. But this morning, as we look at this value, I want to talk to you on this. And here's my title this morning. Full of it. <laughs> full of it. Say to your neighbor, you're full of it. <laughs> you're full of it. And then let's turn, let's re-sanctify ourselves. And turn to the scriptures, um, one, of a, one of the most well-known passages of scripture about Jesus, John chapter 1, the gospel of John chapter 1. And we're going to read this uh, from the first verse, John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life that was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Down to verse 14. And the word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse 16. And of his fullness we have all received. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're full of it. <laughs> you're full of it. Of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, I pray that as we spend time around your word this morning, I pray that your Holy Spirit um, would teach us, would instruct us, but more than that, would transform us. 
Father, I pray that none of us would leave this place this morning the same as we came in. I pray that we would have an encounter with you and that we'd be changed by your grace and by your truth. I pray that we would leave here full of it, full of grace, full of truth, full of love and full of forgiveness. In Jesus' name, everybody said... A recent survey conducted in the UK shows that now more than 50% of people uh, say they have no religion whatsoever. 30 years ago, it was 31%. Not only that, but the same survey showed that less than 40% of people in the UK now identify as Christian. We live in a post-Christian society. What does that mean? Okay, a pre-Christian society is one in which nobody has ever heard of the gospel. There's not that many places left on the earth like that, but it's where the missionaries used to get sent to pre-Christian. They've never heard about Christianity. A Christian thing is obviously where people believe in Christianity. But post-Christian is where people are aware of Christianity, but have rejected it. And we live in that time here now. Now, I would argue that that's mostly because the Christianity that they've been presented with is far from the gospel that is at the heart of God. But we'll talk a little more about that later on. But it's, this whole post-Christian thing is also going on with this other thing that, that's happening in society right now that, that philosophers call post-truth. And this is not just Donald and his fake news, okay? We are living in a post-truth culture where emerging generations, it's really important we understand this, emerging generations are increasingly rejecting the idea that there is any such thing as absolute truth. Truth is relative. Your truth is what you believe. You be who you want to be. And the problem that we face as Christians is that in this post-Christian, post-truth society, people are very skeptical of those of us who believe in absolute truth. In fact, they see us as arrogant and they see us as dangerous. Just look what happens when somebody tries to speak out on one of the social issues that we have going on in our time. Descended upon because Society views them as arrogant and dangerous. Over the years, as this has evolved in culture, the church has responded largely in two different ways. And we've talked a little bit about this before. Unfortunately, neither of these two ways has really been right. The first one's this. Call it dogmatic. It's, I'm right, you're wrong, you're a dirty sinner, you're going to hell. Don't do that. That's wrong. But standing on a street corner with a megaphone telling people they're going to hell doesn't work anymore. Maybe it never worked, I don't know. It might be the truth, but nobody's listening. (laughs) It might be right, but it's not helpful. Green Pastures, God did not call us to be right, He called us to be effective. We cannot antagonize people and influence them at the same time. Maybe you're right about what you're saying. Maybe it's the truth. But if it's not helping the person, even in your rightness, you're wrong. (laughs) Because our job is not to win arguments. It's to win hearts to Jesus. Our job is never to win an argument. It's to win hearts for Jesus. But then we have the other extreme. We'll call this the permissive. It's, oh, just let them do what they like. They don't need to change. Sure, God loves everybody. God's love, as long as we all love each other, everything will be okay. As that prophet Bruno Mars said, You're amazing just the way you are. 
Thank you. But in the name of love, we've set aside what the Bible teaches. This is the mistake of thinking that we love people more than God loves them. We think we know better. And here's the real danger of this. We end up giving people little snippets of Jesus. Just enough to make you feel good, but not enough to transform you. Little snippets. We've got, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Jesus is my best friend. He's my buddy. He's my... But when a storm comes, it's a bit like the vaccines you get or going to get the flu jab. You get that little tiny bit of the disease and it stops you having the full experience of the disease. And we're in danger a little bit when we're on this extreme of giving people just a little bit of Jesus but it stops them having the full experience. You see, Jesus doesn't just want to be your saviour. He wants to be your Lord. He doesn't just want to be your saviour. He wants to be your Lord. Grace, he wants to be your saviour. Truth, he wants to be your Lord. 1 John 1, verse 6 says this, So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living and spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. See, God doesn't just want you to have that warm and fuzzy feeling on the inside and tingles up your spine when your favorite worship song comes on. You know, it's funny, it's like, there's maybe a couple of songs, you're like, <sighs> and then your, your favorite one comes on. <laughs> no, no, no. He wants to transform you deeply, eternally, daily, conforming to his image, living sacrifices. You see, if we're going to reach this post-Christian, post-truth world, we've got to go back to the way Jesus operated. Jesus was full of grace and full of truth. And here's why. We can't show grace without truth because it has no power to heal a broken and hurting world. It might be lovely, warm and fuzzy, but there's no power. But we also can't show truth without grace to a generation that feels like it's arrogant and dangerous. Because it might be true, but they're not listening. We've got help them see that truth is not restrictive. It's not repressive. It's not oppressive. Truth is freeing, liberating, life-giving. I only noticed this this week in in this first chapter of Gospel of John in verse 17. Uh, It's really got me thinking. It says, in verse 17, it says, for the law, the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. See, the law isn't the truth. Truth isn't morals or rules. Truth is a who. The truth is not just an idea. The truth is a person. And when you know the truth, it will not oppress you. It will set you free. You know, so often the image that people have of God or maybe even that we have of God is of this restrictive, repressive, killjoy where everything is forbidden fruit. Don't do that. Don't touch that. Set that down. No, don't look at that. No, don't think that. But think back to Adam and Eve. Think back to God's original plan. He set them, set them out in this beautiful garden. He says, you can have this one or you can have this one or you can eat from this one or you can do that or you can go over there. See, just this one over here. See this one here? Just don't touch it. It's not good for you. Don't touch that one. Everything else, away you go. He says, be fruitful. Multiply. 
which is a great thing for God to say to you when you're standing beside a naked woman in a garden. <laughs> Be <fair. laughs> Sorry. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. <clears throat> Jesus. Holy Spirit, please come back. Jesus was full of grace and truth. The most righteous man that ever walked the earth, who was the way, the truth, and the life, carried himself with such grace that he was called the friend of sinners. Because he held truth and grace in perfect balance. Let me very quickly give you a few little one-liners on truth and grace that if you're using your notes, you can fill in and be all fancy. Without truth, we are corrupt. We have to have truth. We need a standard. But without grace, we are condemned because none of us can reach the standard. Without truth, we become worldly. You know, all of us have stuff in our lives that we need to submit to the truth of God. Uh, my marriage, my, how I look after my kids, how I behave and work, all of this needs submitted to the truth of God because without it, I'll become worldly. But without grace... I'll become judgmental. At least I'm not as bad as your man over there. Truth without grace leads to rules and rebellion. If you don't believe that, come and look after my three-year-old for a weekend. I'll teach you about rules and rebellion. But grace without truth leads to do whatever. Believe whatever. Sorry, grace without truth. I maybe said that the wrong way around. Truth, and here's the real snappy one. Truth without grace is mean. But grace without truth is meaningless. Green pastures. We must build a church together that is full of grace and truth where we don't act like we've got it all together we're all a little messed up but we're all on a journey toward becoming more like Jesus this is not just a feel-good fling with Jesus this is a transforming relationship with him where he is not just our savior but he is also our lord here's another way to say it it's okay to not be okay grace. It's not okay to stay that way. Truth. There's a, another well-known story in, later on in the Gospel of John where Jesus just nails it with how to do this. And I'm sure you're familiar with it. John chapter 8 verse 1 says, Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early in the next morning he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered and he sat down and taught them. As he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught, excuse me, in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? Many of us find ourselves in a situation like that. What do you say about that? This thing that's going on. What, what do you say about that? What do you say about abortion? About same-sex marriage? About trans... What, what do you say? What do you say about it? And we're, we feel forced and we feel boxed into this place where we, we either choose to be called a bigot or we choose to renege on what we believe to be true. And there... The, the Pharisees are trying to do exactly that with Jesus. They're trying to box him in their corner. They're saying, are you going to choose truth? Well, then kill her. Kill her. That's what, that's what the law says. Or are you going to choose grace and disobey God? But Jesus is way too smart for them. Verse 6, they were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and he wrote in the dust with his finger. He didn't say anything to begin with. They kept demanding an answer, so he stood up again and said, All right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. 
When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. There's a, there's a, th- a fairly strongly believed theory among scholars that what Jesus was writing in the dust was the sins of all the guys who were standing around. Yes. He who is without. But notice then how when he comes to the place of correcting this girl, he does it in a respectful, not humiliating way. He doesn't do it in front of a crowd. He connected before he started correcting. Verse 10 says, Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, Where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she says. And Jesus says, Neither do I. Grace, go and sin no more. Truth. You see, grace invites us to be free. But it's truth that sets us free. Grace invites us to be free. But it's the truth that sets us free. Grace with truth is our position. But the tagline is this. We live forgiven. We will forgive. And we'll believe the best of one another. On first reading, it doesn't really look like those two things necessarily go together. But they very much do. And here's why. The only way you'll live full of grace and truth is by living in forgiveness. If we don't feel very much forgiven, we avoid truth. If we feel we don't need forgiven, of very much, we avoid grace. (laughs) Let me put that for you another way. If you're carrying shame and guilt from uh, unforgiven sin that you have, that you're carrying in your life, that you believe God hasn't forgiven you for, you'll avoid truth, you'll run away from it. But if you're kind of a little bit self-righteous and you're looking, at least I'm not as bad as them, You're going to avoid grace because you haven't quite realized just how much you have been forgiven. If we want to live full of it, if we want to live full of grace and truth, we need to not only be aware of how much we need forgiven, but of how much we have been forgiven of. There's a story in the Gospel of Luke chapter 7, which we don't have time to read it all, but Jesus went for dinner at a guy called Simon's house. He was a Pharisee. And uh, while Jesus was eating, this woman came in and she um, started anointing his feet with this really expensive perfume. She, started, she was crying. She, she cleaned his feet with her tears and with her hair. And this guy, Simon, says, if Jesus knew who she was, he would not let her do it. She's a sinner. Jesus knew what was going on and then he told this parable about two, two guys who had been, one had been uh, owed 50 pieces of silver and one had owed 500 pieces of silver to somebody. But the guy forgave their debt. And Jesus said, which one of those guys do you think loved him the most? And Simon said, yeah, the guy who was forgiven the most. And Jesus says to him, that's right. Down in verse 47, he says, I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only a little love. But here's the thing. The reality is, 
no matter how good you are or how good you think you are, you just need the same amount of forgiveness as everybody else. Romans 3.23 says, For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Isaiah 64, 6, all of our righteousness are like filthy rags. Even the stuff that we do that is good doesn't cut it. It ain't enough. It can't qualify us. The more we realize just how far away from God we actually were or are, the more we will appreciate his forgiveness. You see, sinful people, um, for those who can't see me, I'm putting sinful in inverted commas, don't require any more grace from God than you do. We all need the same amount of grace because none of us make the mark. None of us meet the standard we're all equal in the kingdom of grace. And when we get that, when we realize that not only have we got much that needs forgiven, but that we have been forgiven of that much, then we will be able to live full of grace and truth. been fighting with God about this for the last 15 minutes but I'm just going to have to say it um, <laughs> so please don't take this the wrong way right? I can't even think of how to articulate it right? so I've lived in a sh- I've, I, I grew up in a Christian home lived in a sheltered life to a certain degree never smoked never drank never did any of that stuff that you would externally think, oh, he's a good little boy. Um, again, please hear me right when I'm saying this. I, I, I'm an educated guy. I'm a smart guy. I have a master's degree in physics, right? But what I'm saying all that for is, I know how much I've been forgiven. And I'll jump around like an idiot. Because I don't care what anybody thinks. Because I know how much I've been forgiven. I know what he has done. And yet externally, I could tick all the boxes. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We live forgiven. God maybe has brought you here this morning to reaffirm to you that your past, if you're saved, your past, your present, your future sin is forgiven. It's erased. The Bible says as far as the east is from the west. In fact, it says God has forgotten your sin. He has actually forgotten your sin. And he has brought you here this morning maybe to, to assure you of your forgiveness. Now, maybe he needs to assure you this morning that you have been forgiven. Or maybe he needs to assure you this morning of how much you've been forgiven. (laughs) Another part of living in forgiveness is forgiving yourself. And you know, maybe there's somebody here this morning... And you haven't been able to forgive yourself for something that you did or said or made a mess of or made a mistake of 10, 15, 20 years ago. And you've been carrying it. And you're full of guilt. You're full of shame about it. You maybe believe that God has forgiven you for it. But you're not forgiving yourself. Come on, this morning in the presence of God, wants to lift that off you this morning. 
He wants you to be assured of his forgiveness, but he also wants you to forgive yourself. God wants you to live forgiven. So we, we live forgiven, but then there's this thing, we will forgive. We will forgive. Forgiveness, interpersonal forgiveness, is one of the most transformative things on this planet. It can bridge divides. It can restore relationships. It can mend wounds. It can reunite families. But it can even bring health to our bodies and to our minds. There has been research, extensive research, medical research done into this. And it has consistently shown that living in forgiveness reduces pain, reduces physical pain, reduces blood pressure, reduces anxiety, reduces depression, reduces stress. There's a whole list of stuff. Forgiveness is physically and mentally good for you. You know, Jesus talked a lot about it. In the Lord's Prayer, he said, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. In Matthew 5, he said, if you're going to worship God, if you're going to put a gift on the altar and you realize that there's an issue between you and somebody, he says, don't, don't, go, don't go and worship God. He says, go, go sort it out. Go sort it out with your brother or your sister and then come and worship God. Then come and place your gift on the altar. Forgiving somebody who has hurt or betrayed or abused you is unimaginably difficult. Nobody's pretending that it's easy. Nobody's pretending that it's a simple thing. But God's promises and even medical research has shown and proven that it is for your good and for your benefit to forgive people. This is not saying what was done to you is okay. It's not saying that you have to stay in an abusive relationship or in an abusive environment. It's not letting those things hold you back from your future. It's releasing you. It's releasing you from the prison of unforgiveness and of bitterness. It's for your good and for your benefit. One of the most powerful examples of this is Jesus who had been betrayed he'd been mocked he was beaten he was whipped he was slapped he was spat at he was stripped naked he had a crown of thorns placed on his head he was scourged, which is a whip with metal stuff in the end of it. it. pulls your skin out. And after all that, he was then forced to carry a heavy cross beam up a hill where he was nailed in his hands and in his feet. And then he was hoisted up in front of everybody, naked, shamed. And he said, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, forgive them. See, what, what they were doing, what they did to Jesus was indescribably horrendous. Yet Jesus knew that he couldn't die for the sins of the world with bitterness in his heart. It would disqualify him. This was his final test. How would he respond? How would he respond to the betrayal, to the abuse, to the shame, to being misunderstood, to the torture? Thank God he chose the path of forgiveness. Thank God, he said, Father, 
forgive them. He didn't excuse their actions. He didn't say what they were doing was right. He didn't justify. He just refused to let what they were doing get into him. He refused to let bitterness and unforgiveness penetrate his heart. There's another part of the story where they offer him bitter wine to drink when he's on the cross. And he spits it out. He says, I'm not drinking it. I am not drinking the cup of bitterness. And he says to those of us this morning who who are struggling with forgiving some people, he says, I know how you feel. He says, I've been there. Trust me. Forgiving them is for your good. It is for your benefit. Bitterness and unforgiveness will destroy you from the inside out. You know, it doesn't come even close, anywhere close to comparing what Jesus went through, but as a church, the whole time we've existed, and particularly so recently, we've experienced a little bit of criticism. You may well have had to experience some of it in your workplace or in school or even in your home or among your friendship circles. But how we choose to respond is vital. What are we going to be full of? Are we going to be full of grace and truth? Or are we going to be full of bitterness? Are we going to be full of forgiveness or unforgiveness? Because here's the crazy thing. Our critics are our mission field. Our critics are our mission field. And how we carry ourselves will have eternal significance in their lives. You see, grace with truth is our position. We live forgiven, we will forgive, and we believe the best of one another. Let's close our eyes and bow our heads for a moment in the presence of God. And I want to just take a moment while everyone's head is bowed for us all to respond to the word of God this morning. And firstly, maybe you're here this morning or you're watching online and you've never really opened your heart to Jesus to receive his love and his forgiveness and his acceptance. But now is an opportunity for you to do so. You know, this is a serious moment. Don't, don't miss this moment. None of us know when we're going to take that step into eternity. It's so important that we have a certainty as to where we're going to spend eternity. It's a long time. And maybe you're here this morning because God wants to meet you for that first time. And he wants to overwhelm you with his grace and his acceptance, and his forgiveness. And then he wants to take you on a journey of transformation and freedom. He wants to take the weight off your shoulders that you've been carrying for years. He wants to bring a peace and a comfort to your soul like you've never experienced before. The Apostle Paul says it very simply. He says, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. In just a moment, all of us are going to say a prayer together. And if in saying these words, you are surrendering your life to Jesus as Savior and as Lord, you'll be saved. Don't miss 
this moment. Don't miss this life-changing encounter with God. Let's all pray together, follow after me. Heavenly Father, I come to you, a sinner in need of a Savior, and I thank you today for your Son, Jesus Christ. I believe he died to forgive my sin and rose again to give me life. I receive this new life. Make me a new creation. This is my new beginning. I'll follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. And just as all of us still have our eyes closed and heads bowed, if you prayed that prayer for the first time this morning, would you just raise up your hand for me so that we can see it and get you. Thank you. See your hand in the balcony. Anybody else? Pray that prayer for the first time this morning. There's two down there. Thank you. You'll see your hands. Lovely. Come on, the presence of God is here. Anybody else want to receive God's forgiveness this morning? There's three people. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, you know what? Maybe, maybe you're a bit scared about putting your hand up. That's okay. Please come and talk to us at the end of the service. We love to pray with you. And if you're watching online, please make contact with us. Again, we'd love to to talk with you and lead you to Jesus. What do we say about those people who have come to faith this morning? What does the church say about that? Come on. For him. God's not just quite finished yet. There's a few of us Christians that God wants to meet with this morning too. Why don't we all stand up just in the presence of God. Maintain, let's just maintain this attitude of worship. I believe there are five, I'm not going to spend a long time on this, but I believe there's five different things that God wants us to respond to him on this morning. The first thing is this. There's some of us here this morning who are Christians, been Christians for years, but we're carrying shame and we're carrying guilt because we don't quite believe that God could forgive us we don't quite we haven't quite taken the step of accepting his forgiveness the second one is this I'm going to talk through all these and then we're all going to respond together so nobody knows who's who nobody knows what's what the second one of this is maybe there's some of us in here this morning that maybe haven't just quite appreciated how much forgiveness we needed (laughs) maybe we had a little bit of self-righteousness going on Maybe there's a few of us here this morning that need to repent of being judgmental, need to repent of leading with truth and not having much grace behind it. Maybe there's some of us here this morning that need a bit of help from God to to actually say some things that are true. Maybe we've been being far too graceful in certain situations when the truth of God needs to come out. Maybe you need strength for that this morning. And finally, the most difficult one, maybe there's some of us here this morning that need God's help to forgive. I've been carrying it for years. It's eating you up inside. It's destroying you from the inside. But God wants to set you free from that this morning. Okay, so in any of those five things, there's probably at least three of them that I'm dealing with right now. But in any of those five things this morning, if you need to respond to God, now just lift up your hand for me. All together, as a family, let's just lift up our hands. There's hands all over the place this morning. We're all in this together. We're all on a journey on this come on Heavenly Father I thank you for your presence in this place and Holy Spirit you know you know each need in this room you know each heart you know what each of us is walking through and you know what the step that each of us need to now take so I very simply pray in your presence God in this moment of worship and encounter with you in your presence, Lord. I pray for every brother and sister in this room, whatever it is they need right now, God, whatever it is they need to meet you on right now, God, I pray that the power of the Holy Spirit would overwhelm them right now, would overshadow them right now, God, and that you do a work, a miraculous work, Lord, in their lives that only you can do, Lord, for it's all for your name and for your glory and for your sake. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh,